I'm Mercury Black, and I'm here today with Dr. Oren Amate and Nolan Watson, and we're going to be discussing the topic of death. Uh, this won't be from the perspective of grieving loved ones or thinking about when we lose others. Uh, tonight's discussion will be about when we think about it from the first-hand perspective of contemplating our own mortality. Um, each of us have our own unique perspective on death here is why the three of us are gathered. Uh, in a moment, I'll let Dr. Amate and then Nolan speak for themselves. Um, I'll just say that for most, many of the viewers will know, um, but for anyone who doesn't, I was hit by a bus and I had a near death experience, not of the kind where my heart actually stopped, but there's another variety of near death experience where it appears that you're about to die and you have um, experiences similar to people whose hearts actually stopped. So for me, time froze. And I went into that black area where the tunnel is. I had the feeling of being met by death and of having loved ones waiting on the other side. Um, when I came out of it with the impact of the bus, I obviously wasn't killed. But I still, that phenomenologically felt like a real experience to me and does feel like I was on an actual threshold and going somewhere. Um, and so I'll pass it on now to you, Oren. Um, what perspective are you bringing to this? Well, I've had two uh, close encounters with uh, potential death. Um, I've actually had a few. When I was eight years old, I drowned, uh, and they had to bring me back to life. Uh, that was at, I believe it was just before I was eight. Um, my brother luckily rescued me, uh, or he ran, got out of the water and was able to alert other people who were able to come and get me. Um, I actually had an out-of-body experience, possibly, I'm not sure. Maybe that's just the memory, the recollection, who knows. Um, but that was at eight. And then um, about four, uh, four years ago, almost to the day right now, I found out I had a huge tumor on my kidney. And uh, there, if, if, it was, uh, if the cancer had spread to my lymph nodes, I would have, I think it's like a 12 or 13% chance of living in the next 10 years. So we didn't know, and that was uh, May or June that that was discovered. Uh, and so my surgery was at near the beginning of September. And then I think maybe near the end of September, after the biopsy, they were able to determine that it hadn't spread. So I should be okay. And I have been okay since then. But for those four months, basically, I had no idea whether, you know, it would have been really bad news. And then the other time was uh, during, right before the kidney uh, removal, they had to do a health check on me. And they found out that my heart condition, which we had known about for a number of years, was far worse than what they thought it was. It was also totally different from what they thought it was. I think it had been 10 or 15, maybe 10 years, maybe more, that they had uh, been following it. And what they thought it was and what it really was were two different things. So they monitored that as well. And then in... December of 2017, so about a year after the kidney removal, uh, my doctor suddenly said, okay, you took a really bad turn for the worse. Uh, I could barely walk two or three uh, minutes without just having my heart just stabbing, uh, numbness in my hands and legs. I could barely do anything. And uh, But I went to Costa Rica, didn't want to ruin the family vacation. So, uh, hot weather does wonders for you. I was running up and down mountains, uh, snorkeling. It was great. I don't know. But then they had me on the table at the end of February for open heart surgery. And the doctor said, when we opened you up, they said, all the testing we did, he said, nothing prepared us for how bad it was. He didn't, he couldn't believe that I was, I had been standing before that. So, and then they had to actually put me on ice. So technically I was dead for a few more minutes uh, because they had to do some things with the heart that they weren't planning. So uh, that, those were my three experiences, I guess, uh, with my mortality. Um, and, you know, some people, well, I'll, I'll talk about it afterwards. But the fact is, if I had known how bad the heart was, there's no way I would have been doing uh, in, Costa, in Costa Rica or in Mexico, whatever it was, one of the countries, I think it was Costa Rica. There's no way I would have been doing what I was doing because I would have been afraid of just dropping dead of a heart attack. My heart was gone. Okay. So, but thankfully I'm here. So that's my story. Yeah, and so my experience has been a little different from uh, Dr. Orrin and from Mercury. It's been more of a, something throughout my life that um, I've had to think about uh, because I have a, a condition, uh, muscular dystrophy, which uh, is a progressive 
disease in which uh, your muscles basically de decay over time and it's because there's a, a lack of a certain protein that my body doesn't produce and so the muscles yeah decay over time and so um the life expectancy you know is generally like mid-20s is the average i think and so i'm 24 now but there's a lot of variation because it's one of those things where if I get really sick or something with with like pneumonia or something or some respiratory flu or something that's really bad, that could, you know, that could do me in. But if I'm able to avoid that kind of stuff and try to monitor my health as best as possible. There's some people that live into their, their 40s even I've seen and so so like with um, anyone I guess going through life there's a um, could happen anytime but it's not something you can really I guess control so so that's been my experience and um, I guess why it's been more relevant recently is I've had some, just uh, during the fall, I've had some health issues that um, they don't seem to be like, um, I guess, particularly dangerous, but but I had what seemed like some difficulty breathing for a while there and some kind of nerve stuff perhaps going on with my with my arms and shoulders and just things that have generally made me not not feel that great for a while and but uh, during that time I've been thinking a lot more about well um, yeah, I guess about death and about, I guess, a more realization of, of, of the fact that I don't have ultimate control over, over what happens to me. And even for someone like me, who's thought a lot about of, like, who's had to think about this for a long time and hasn't really been able to I don't know if distract myself in the same way that maybe a healthy person has, is able to, or I guess just doesn't think about it as much. But um, even for me, I found that before I've had these issues, it wasn't something I really thought about. It didn't seem all that real, but having this, this more concrete feeling of, well, this might not be you know, the current health issues I've been having might not be I guess fatal or severely dangerous or anything, but like down the road it could be and what would I do in that situation? So I guess I've just been thinking about it a lot more and I talked a little bit to Mercury just about about it more generally a few days ago. And yeah, we thought it might be a good idea to talk to uh, Dr. Abate because I'm sure there's uh, a lot of other people out there who to have um, perhaps had to think about this or have maybe felt isolated in dealing with with death or just more generally, it's not something uh, we tend to talk about that much in, in society. Yeah, and I think that especially now, it's probably something that even people without your condition to be affected 
by other illnesses that with the pandemic going on right now, there's probably other people who are in the same position as you of thinking more seriously about their death. Um, Because I think a lot of us, at least I know at your age, while I was certainly aware I was going to die, I was really internally pretending I wasn't most of the time. Um, I wasn't actually facing that. And how, what's been your real emotional reaction to contemplating your mortality? Um, like, has it been stressing you out? Um, and yeah, do you have a specific question you want to start with, with Dr. Amate? Uh, well, I guess when I, when I first started feeling not well, I was uh, just more and more fearful and, and anxious about it and I still am at times but I've gotten the sense that I'm more comfortable with it and I guess when I've really started to learn and it's still difficult sometimes uh, is to realize that I don't really have control over it like um if I'm going to die, I'm going to die, and there's nothing I can do to, uh, to avoid that. You know, there's certain, you can try to be healthy as much as you want, but ultimately, you don't have control over it. And the best kind of way to respond to that is uh, to kind of I don't know, let go of it. I've also found that I think uh, Dr. Abate mentioned this a few times of um, like this analogy of a flashlight where you can choose to shine the light on a certain thing or a certain topic, but you can also choose to direct the flashlight elsewhere to to kind of the things in front of you or the things you're working on or your like life kind of responsibilities um, instead of always um, I guess being in that anxious state of worrying about about your mortality and so it's not that you're ignoring it or pretending that it's not real but uh, you're just choosing to focus your attention somewhere else for the time being. And I've, I've found that kind of the most useful approach for myself. Where I know some people can really find contemplating it helpful. I'm like kind of entering into that experience or yeah, just really thinking about death could be helpful for some people. And I guess I could relate a little bit to that um, with some of like the poetry and writing that I do on some of topics like that. I find that that does help me. And yeah. Kind of lost so where I'm going with that, but yeah. That gave me a question for Dr. Amate. Um, like what Nolan pointed out how in our last discussion, we talked about how there comes a time to turn your mind away from certain things. But I also think, at least for me, I prefer life now that I'm comfortable with death to before. And so what's the balance between not looking at it too much, you know, and knowing when to turn the flashlight away? And how much do you think it's healthy for us to think about death. Do you think that's something that we should face before the moment's upon us? Is there such a thing as looking away too much? And what's looking at it, um, or what's looking at it too much, what's looking away too much? Right, really tricky question because it's different for everybody, of course. But I would say there's a line or there's a, uh, a spectrum between total ignorance, fantasy basically, and rumination 
getting caught up in it and becoming depressed over it. We know that when you ruminate over things, especially things that you cannot control, it does predict depression or a certain type of depressed mood. And it will exacerbate any negative thoughts or feelings you may be having at the time. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the broadest answer I can give. And again, the ignorance is not good because although the poem, uh, there's a line, ig the line ignorance is bliss actually comes from, uh, I think it was from World War I or II, but they were talking about the fact that, uh, you know, as humans, we are cursed with the knowledge, unlike any other species, aside from maybe orcas and perhaps some chimpanzees, that we are mortal, okay, that we have an, a finite period, uh, time here. And so ignorance was, is bliss is supposed to say that, you know, we're not burdened. If, if we were ignorant, we wouldn't be burdened with that realization, right? Uh, but ignorance is not good in the sense of, uh, you know, as, as Nolan was saying, for example, like doing whatever you can to maybe maximize uh, the time that you do have. If you know that you have a limited amount of time, whether it's 100 years, 80 years, or 25 years, right, trying to make the most of that time, knowing that there's things that you can do to be healthier. Like when I found out about my kidney, first of all, nobody knew. They were surprised I was even going in for surgery. The only people who knew were my patients where I said, I'm going to be out for a couple of weeks, you know, and that was it. People and but I lost thirty pounds, and people thought, "Oh my God!" That like they, they thought it was the cancer because it was a you know, quite quick drop. But I said, "If I'm going to go under the blade, I'm going to get myself in the best shape possible." Cut out the vices, got myself in great shape. So if I was just fantasizing, "Oh, everything's going to be okay," I wouldn't have given myself a better chance of you know doing well, you know, in, in all in all aspects. And we know healthy body, healthy mind as well. So uh, you know. To, uh, so to, to, to fantasize, pretend it's not real, to, to not, take, not take control over things you can do to mitigate certain things, the ignorant side, not good. Ruminating, thinking about it all the time, not good. Um, so somewhere in between, okay? And one thing I wanted to bring up though, because it's very important, uh, it's, there's a theory called terror management theory, TMT, terror management theory. And the research behind it is questionable. The premise, I'll tell you guys in a second, I, I agree with it 100%. I just don't like a lot of the research because um, they basically find data that's, or results that support the theory, but there's a dozen at least ex alternative explanations for why they found what they found. So, you know, and, and the research is done by a small cohort of people mostly, you know, like 50% of the studies, 40 to 50% are done by the same people, the people who propose this the theory. So it's a bit questionable, but the idea is back to what I said about humans being the only ones maybe who know of our mortality. They say that we kind of have an ingrained reflex, an ingrained unconscious process that kind of keeps that knowledge away. All right, that's how we manage the terror of knowing we're going to be gone like that. If you think about it, in the grand scheme of things, we're in and out. Okay, so the idea is that we unconsciously, subconsciously, however you want to call it, prevent ourselves. We compartmentalize almost and don't think about our end. So that's why, and it doesn't mean that we don't know it. It's just that we know it, but we say we're not going to think about it. And so at times of stress, uh, mostly it's stress, okay, but the defenses come down. This is why sometimes when people get high or get too high, especially with edibles, they freak out because they're exposed to things that they otherwise, they know is real, but they don't think about it. They compartmentalize. And one of them happens to be our mortality. So that's just, you know, that's, that's something very important to, to think about. And so um, like with Nolan, accepting you and 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 mercury yourself you said when you accepted your mortality you're able to appreciate and embrace life better so it's important to accept it but not to ruminate and get stuck in it okay and before i forget i hate to go on and on but i'm going to forget it but i'm just gonna i'm gonna put the word out there so we can come back to it later one important thing that for nolan or for anybody else who either is dealing with a a terminal illness or who had something so terrible happen to them that you, know, you, you wouldn't expect it, you wouldn't wish it upon your worst enemy. The fact is, these are forms of injustice, okay? And when people talk about having gratitude, all the healthy things in Mercury that you and I talked about, when we talk about gratitude, when we talk about having a healthy perspective, accepting things and everything, that's all great on paper, but we should never lose sight of the fact that if we're not going through it ourselves, 
we shouldn't be lecturing other people, whether it's your own, you know, issues or you've lost somebody like trying to help someone deal with the loss of a child. Right. No one knows what it's like until you've walked in that person's shoes. So I don't want to lose sight of the fact that it is a form of injustice and Nolan, you know, um, you know, you've had this, I guess your, your entire life essentially. Right. You've been, yeah. right. You know, with ups and downs, but the fact is, as a child, it's like, why would you be cursed with something like this? That's a kind of injustice. Why couldn't you have a healthy, happy-go-lucky, whatever life? And I can apply that to many people who may not be dying, but who've had such terrible things happen to them. And so sometimes people talk too theoretically, and they lose sight of the fact that there is a true, and I'm going to keep using the word, it feels like injustice, because that's something that really kneecaps us. So when we feel something's not fair, but people don't want to say that's not fair, because people say that all the time. I go to Starbucks, I ordered, you know, two sugars, I got one and three quarters. That's not fair. And people lose perspective. So I just want to put it out there so we don't forget, and we, we'll probably return to that. Yeah, uh, just to uh, clarify a little bit. Uh, my condition is like progressive, so so earlier on in my childhood, I was like able to walk and, and run and do that kind of thing. But um, so it's been kind of a slow uh, decline where it's you know I started having more difficulty walking and doing that kind of stuff, and then it was more I was using like a one of those mobility scooters part time. And then I, you know, transitioned into a wheelchair when I was like uh, around 11 or 12, sometime there. And then it's been kind of uh, steady, more well, similar since then. And just over the last, like, uh, I don't know, five or seven years, I had more. Uh, more difficulty with breathing, so I started uh, using this um, ventilator and stuff throughout the day. So, so yeah, just to uh, add some more detail. And uh, the first time we ended up speaking with Nolan, he wrote into the channel and uh, he wanted to discuss the aspect of Jordan Peterson's work that involved not becoming resentful about things, just bearing your own cross and moving forward. Um, so that was where our first conversation started was uh, Nolan came on with both me and my partner Ryan Holsapel discussing that he didn't want to fall into that trap of allowing like the, the actual injustice to turn him into a bad person and he didn't want to become a tyrant over people around him. And so his involvement with the community right from the beginning was that he wanted to learn how to handle it in a way that was, I suppose, morally upright, for lack of another term coming to mind. Right. And, and that's why it's so important, um, you know, to have that, when I talk about spectrum, because I would not want, when I say that it's an injustice, I would never recommend somebody to spend all their time, again, ruminating over and festering in the resentment and, and I tell people resentment is it's one of the worst feelings and it's insidious and it will just take over your life. Um, so, you know, we have to, again, balance this idea of I want to be strong. I want to be healthy. I want to accept as much as I can my circumstance, but then not be too blithe or not to have people around us not appreciate what, you know, we're going through. And again, that's, that's where that spectrum is. That's where the balance is. And because that feels like, this is an interesting, I'm going to take a bit of a tangent here, but many people, whether it's mental or physical uh, illness, when they start doing a little bit better, just a bit, especially with depression, right? The person is morbidly depressed, maybe suicidal. And as soon as there's a flicker, tiny flicker of light, people are so happy to finally see the person doing better. And so they in response, they're so excited for the person. And, and basically there's a disconnect between how the people around the person are responding and how the person really feels. And then the person feels like, okay, you really don't get me. And now you're going to have expectations of me, whether that's real or not. That's the fear that people have. So it's, again, I just, I can't stress this enough that people have to recognize that words are great, 
theories and sentiments we should strive for, but always keep in mind that there's a real person who's dealing with what we're talking about. Uh, you know, it's about any issue. So, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, Nolan, that that's the perspective that you came with when you first reached out to the community saying, I don't want to be consumed with resentment, bitterness, anger, right? But we shouldn't forget that if you feel those ways at times, that's totally normal. It would not be human to not feel that. Or if someone else is watching this and thinking like, fuck, I'm in the same positions Nolan's in, but I'm not where he is. Like I am resentful and I feel I deserve to be. If someone's watching this and thinking that, like, absolutely. It's the same. Even Nolan doesn't know what you're going through, even if you have the identical condition. Right. So yeah, just to uh, add to that, like it's still something that I struggle with. It's not as if um, it's something that I don't think about or something that I don't feel at times. Uh, I still do. And like with this uh, recent uh, kind of bout of health, health issues, like I've noticed that like I felt more like that at times. And it was, a, I guess, a good reminder in a sense to uh, remember that, like, I still do have those feelings sometimes, and it's like, yeah, I guess, trying to recognize that and, like, be okay with that at times, uh, without, of course, letting it get out of hand, but I'm really to that. Sometimes I do feel resentful or angry or frustrated um, dealing with my condition that, that it's okay, but then also to not, um, I guess, kind of ruminate on it and kind of uh, get caught in like a downward kind of spiral, which I could do sometimes if, um, like, if I uh, don't act the way I would have liked in a certain situation, I do have, a, like, a cr critical part of myself that will um, sometimes I'll beat myself up for it, and then that will be, like, make it worse, and, yeah, it could be. Um, dangerous to get caught in that in that spiral, but so I think uh, being able to recognize and acknowledge your feelings, um, even if they're negative or not something you want to feel, or yeah, even if it's not something you necessarily would want to feel. And like, how uh, is it? when you sense that spiral or when you're dealing with that, um, how is it that you manage that? When you sense you're spiraling, what are the tools you have to get yourself like free of that spiral or what tools do you have to deal with the anger and resentment that you find most useful? Well, I guess sometimes it's like I don't have it. Sometimes I'm not like, you just get out of it where I guess the main thing that I do is, is to recognize when it's happening and then that could help me to, to get out of it. But um, I guess writing and like poetry has been a useful outlet for myself where I guess those uh, negative feelings or feelings that um, that are not, I guess, what we might call virtuous, um, where I can, I don't know, express that without, in a way that, I don't know, people might find helpful or is 
I guess, productive as, as opposed to destructive, where you're using the feelings to produce something. So I find that is, is useful for me. But, um, yeah, I would say those are the main things, just trying to notice it. And I find, uh, found writing helpful for myself. And to circle back around to where you started then, um, you said that when thinking about death, it wasn't, I wasn't picking up that you were saying the problem was sort of depression. It was more um, that you referenced that sometimes it's a fear involving your thought about death. Uh, what kind of fears are it? Um, have you taken the time to examine what the specific fear is? You know, sometimes Peterson talks about when something's vague and unformed, it's much, much larger. Do you know what the specifics of your particular fears are when it comes to this subject? Well, it's not something like I've articulated or written down at this point, but like, I guess, well, like during the summer, I felt like I was making a lot of progress. So with regards to my goals with um, writing and um, kind of, uh, building a little more of a social life than I had had before. And so I felt like I was making good progress and things were going re really well. Then I kind of just started not feeling well, more tired. And, and yeah, so, and then that in the fall, I kind of got worse. And, so a lot of things were bothering me. So I think part of the fear is uh, not being able to like accomplish some of the things that I'd like to, whether that's, you know, goals with my writing or, you know, wanting to produce a book or something at some point. So I think part of the fear is not being able to accomplish certain things And I guess, well, yeah, or the fear of like uh, being left out of things, you know, if I were to die or something. And yeah, I guess I don't really have. And I would say there was a, de a depressive element to that where, yeah, there was a depressive element. As I got, I guess, less, I don't know, the, the anxiety died down over a while as, as I kind of got used to, to, to how I was feeling, and even though it wasn't, um, I wasn't feeling as good as before, it was, I don't know, getting used to feeling different or having more difficulty with the breathing, but um, I kind of got used to it after a while. Recently, I've been, for the last few months, I've been feeling quite a bit better than I was before. So it might even have been that there was a psychological component to it as well. That's interesting. I was expecting more for you to say that there was some sort of fear of death, whereas what I heard there was not that it was the thought of what happens at the moment of death or afterwards, but more that it was sort of the fear of missing out on things of, in life. Am I hearing that correct? Yeah, uh, just, just to add to that, though. I would say there was an element of fear with, with regards to the death itself. I remember hearing some, some story, but I don't know, it, it stuck in my head for a long time of 
there was there was some natural disaster or some hurricane or something. Uh, I I think it was in the U.S. somewhere. I don't remember the details, but there's some story I heard somewhere of the, the hospitals losing power, and there was you know some people on ventilators and stuff. Um, basically, well. The machines that were helping them breathe quit working. And so there was some story of someone who just, like, yeah, there some details I was just thinking about, but basically there was this moment of this person dying and the nurse or someone was, I don't know, just sitting with them as they ran out of breath and I don't know, hearing this story was like, um, I mean, it was kind of terrifying to think about if I were in that situation. And so I guess the idea of dying in some like way like that, um, I don't know, painful way has been scary. And I don't know, I guess just that story stuck in my head for whatever reason. And so the idea of like suffocating to death, I, I guess, scared me for a while. But yeah, I would say that it's, that I'm less afraid of like death itself and more at this point, more about the like missing out kind of um, fear. Yeah, and for me, even when you spoke of death there, it was still all the life side of death. Um, like I think for all of us, the thought of dying slowly and painfully is horrible. Um, although like for me personally, it's the pain and the suffering that's horrible. It's just as scary to think about being tortured and having it not end in death. Well, actually for me, that's scary. So I can really, really identify that with that fear of pain. Um, but I still didn't hear um, that you were afraid of what comes after. Is that just that you hadn't gotten that far? Or um, like, so is any part of it um, a worry about what happens after the moment of death, as opposed to all the things about life that you've expressed so far? Okay. I would say that the after part doesn't really worry me very much. I'm not sure what the reason, I guess. Um, if I take like the atheistic approach, it's, well, it's just over after that. So what's there to fear? And I guess the other part of me, the more uh, Christian perspective is, well, well, there's the whole hell thing, but but for, I'm not really, I don't really think about that all that much, or I'm not sure how I, how I, like what my perspective is on that, I guess. Some, I have some sympathy for the more, um, I don't know, some people would say universalist idea, but um, more of seeing what lies after is kind of a, or kind of like um, the idea of purgatory, where it's a, an ongoing journey, I guess you could say. So, so yeah, the the after death part doesn't really, is it something that really causes too much fear or or anxiety for me? And, um, and for you, Orrin, having different experiences with life and death so far, um, when you think about death now, uh, what fears do you have about it? Sort of the, like, the same as the, all the aspects Nolan mentioned there, both about what's left of life to live and your fears or thoughts on what comes after. It's tricky, uh, and I, tricky in the sense of I have to be very careful with how I word what I'm about to word, okay? So I'm going to kind of try to dance around some things maybe, just for my own protection, okay? Uh, my perspective on life and death, 
uh, did change with you know with the first surgery. Um, I was there. I had two moments where I one moment uh, maybe I don't know when it was shortly after finding out where I was in bed alone and I sort of forced myself to cry. Okay, it was kind of it was a weird feeling. It wasn't it wasn't even tears. It was just like I thought I should feel this way, and I was kind of having a dialogue with some higher power. Okay, kind of like, and it was, it was almost like I was play acting. It was a bit weird. Okay. Uh, just like, I just, I couldn't bring myself to, it. I kind of felt bad. Like, why am I going through this? That injustice I talked about before, but I couldn't really muster it. So that was kind of a iffy moment. But the second time was uh, my family was away and they didn't know any of this. I'm not going to tell them while they, because uh, they were traveling. So I wasn't going to ruin their time. And they were coming that the, the day that they were, I was going to pick them up. I spoke to my spirit guide and he, uh, we were just talking about it. And it was that moment, suddenly the walls came down where I imagined not telling them about this, but what if I have to tell them or what if they learn themselves, daddy's not here anymore. And that's the part that got me. So it was more about, I want to be there for my family. That's what I value most. And that's the only time, you know, as, even as I say it now, I'm starting to kind of feel something uh, that was the only aspect of it uh, that really, it, it hit me. And I was just like, I, I just broke up. I couldn't talk. I was in tears. I was heaving almost. Um, you know, so uh, that, that told me that basically I want to make sure that I um, basically, I don't want to be egotistical and say they're going to miss me. I hope they would miss me. But it was more that I don't want them to suffer because I wasn't around. And I'm a pretty selfish person. I'm an incredibly selfish person. Uh, my family might be the first people to tell you that. Maybe my, my family of origin, not my kids, I hope, who knows, okay? But for me, being there for my family, making sure that when I go, that they're gonna be well taken care of, that gave me comfort. That's how I deal with it, that I wanna make sure, there's a few things I wanna do, and the most important, the very first thing I think about is that my wife and children, don't suffer in any way. And because of that, just a little side note here, I had this weird dilemma. I only thought of suicide once uh, in that, okay? And the thought was, if, the, if the, the cancer spreads, or had spread, sorry, and you know that I know I have only a certain amount of time left, I don't work, for, like, I have no private insurance, and I know that this kind of medication and so on can be very costly. Uh, because of my heart condition, I don't have you know insurance. I, I couldn't get catastrophic insurance. I basically did not want to think that all the money that I had saved up for my family to make sure that if I got hit by a bus yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, you know, if any of that happened, right? I didn't want. I always wanted to know that my family would be taken care of. And then I thought, I don't want that to all dwindle, right? Um, you know, taking care of me to try to give me some better quality of life you know, at the suffering of my family. So that was, I thought about that. And the only thing that stopped me, because I'm a very pragmatic person, was I thought, if I kill myself, what would the insurance, like, would, would I lose my insurance? Okay, like, that was simply, like, I was just thinking pragmatics. I thought, okay. And, and so, and, and this is how I tried to deal with the life and death, which was purely pragmatism. However, and here's the part where I've got to dance around a little bit, we know we, there's research, there's, 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 um, there's protocols in place right now, and I really hope that the governments do it right for one of the rare times and that they will take certain, um, let's say, natural medicines off the banned list. I'm talking about mushrooms, or, uh, psilocybin, um, maybe ayahuasca, it's a bit too powerful, but let's say with mushrooms. And I've seen the studies, I've seen the, the projects. Uh, it's very heart-wrenching, uh, the film that I saw, and I spoke to the person involved in it, where they gave people who had terminal illnesses one dose of mushrooms. It was one gram or two grams, I don't even know, maybe one, between one and two grams, one session only. And it helped them come to terms with the inevitable. And that inevitable, I think with two or three of the people, at least two people, they, they passed before the completion of the film. Okay, that's where it's, it's quite touching. But the fact is that, you know, these medicines, they don't change our brain. They just open up pathways within our brains. They open up perspectives that we may not have had previously that somehow just helps us come to terms 
with our mortality better. So all I'm going to say is over the course of my time, and my spirit guide, by the way, took me to a, a First Nations um, a healing lodge, a sweat lodge, sorry, the sweat lodge, and we did it a couple of times. And let's just say that I've had experiences in life that have allowed me, I would say, to gain the same comfort, same peace with my, you know, inevitable, inevitable, eventual end. Okay, that that somehow I've come to that place. And five years ago, I wouldn't have been there. And it's not the age; it's the experience and the perspective and the mindset. So currently, knowing that I have done what I can to make sure that my family is okay, uh, I am. You know, I, I say that, you know, I don't want to die, obviously. And I don't have this belief of, you know, my time will come when it will come. I don't believe that. Like, I'm going to try to cheat death as long as I can. But when it comes, I do believe I will be ready. And I'm not worried about what happens afterward. I actually think that what happens afterward, and I have no scientific evidence of this. It's a belief system I have. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm, I will just admit, you know, that it's a personal belief I have. That, you know, and I think there's enough evidence that I can shape it in a way that fits into this. I believe that, you know, when our time comes that this, the energy, I mean, we know that there's energy all around us, energy we cannot see. I don't know what it's like, but I, I can find myself looking forward to that next journey. I, quite frankly, I would prefer to be here. I'd prefer to be on this earth. But to me, I've just, again, through the last couple of years, I've been able to adopt a perspective that these you know, physical forms is just, it's one element of the stages that we go through. And I want to believe that again, I'm, I, I just chalk it up to energy. Uh, and that's, that's how I've come to terms with it. And, and, and the other side, just so you know, get back to the pragmatics. And I thank Richard Dawkins for this. Uh, he wrote about this in The Selfish Gene, where he basically characterized as we're just vessels. We carry this genetic code within us. And it passes generation after generation after generation. And there's always a part of us. He calls it the immortal coil. DNA he calls the immortal coil because part of us lives on forever, whether it's our own children or if we know we have anybody else that's related to us in any way. And we're almost all 99 point something genetically related to know that there's something in us that continues to live. And I'm fortunate enough to have three daughters who will carry on a very high percentage of my genetic uh, component. But even if I didn't have the children, I would, you know, find knowledge in that, you know, that a part of me lives on forever. It's egotistical, maybe it's self-centered, but that gives me peace and comfort because I am not religious. Uh, and I wanted to ask Nolan, I mean, Nolan alluded to the, um, the you said the, Christ, the Christian in you. I, I'm not sure how much of it is, but I want to ask you whether religion, a belief of an afterlife, a, a belief of something uh, helps in any way. Because that's, again, I've had my own belief. I've, I've developed my own belief over this. So that's my perspective on all this. And Yeah, I, I kind of have found that helpful, I guess. Um, where I come at it is mostly a Christian perspective. I guess um, probably most similar to like the um, Eastern Orthodox kind of way of looking at things and yeah and the way they kind of see death is is that uh, the journey basically continues on afterwards so so um, I don't really have a specific I guess commitment or anything at the moment but um, I guess where we're where my perspective would be would be closest to to, uh, to that to, to that idea of uh, a journey that continues on, but uh, yeah, that I have found that helpful. And while I have, I find like I'm no one thing on every issue I've got sub personalities that see it different ways. So I do exact, I have a sub personality that's very similar to Richard Dawkins that looks at it all that way. But even that part of me, like when it looks at death and thinks, what if Ricky Gervais is right, that we just blank out, uh, I see no problem with that whatsoever. And so the majority of me though, genuinely believes like in that looser sense of the word, that Peterson uses um, in life after death. 
and having had the near death experience and then having had the continuous experiences of psychosis, depression, all sorts of altered states. Um, my view on death is entirely the mystical side rather than the practical. And I see things even like that immortal coil that Richard Dawkins talks about. To me, that's just because as above, so below, and the universe is fractal, and of course it mirrors on every level of reality. Um, so I live in that weird world that I'm not claiming is objectively true, but my experience of life now is such that I do really strongly have that ridiculous belief that I'll die at the right time. If I'm plugged into my true will properly, I will handle each moment of now properly. If I do that, then the moment of now I die in will be proper. I, and really, like, I find it hard to even dig up the doubt on that and get much emotion behind it unless I'm really depressed. Um, so I have an odd inner certainty that, I think all that other stuff is more real. Um, whether it's the platonic forms or morphic resonance or the collective unconscious, whatever it is. And while I love Christianity, I was raised a Catholic altar boy. It's I believe in the thing that's bigger than any of us being able to explain. And I think that everything we do is an expression of that source. And that all art, religion, science, magic, all of that is describing different aspects of the same elephant. And it seems to me that the materialist aspect of it is not unimportant, but it seems to me small. And I really do, like a shaman or a magician or a lunatic, live with one foot in both worlds all the time. Like, when I talk about I'm doing all of this because my angel tells me to, that's, it's not an act, it's not a routine, I'm not being funny. I experience interactions with non-physical entities that are either feel as real as this world or oddly more real. And I guess the same way a lot of people who say that about their DMT trip or their mushrooms, that in some way they don't know how to describe, that's more real. So me, I really do act as though that's true, but it's not from analysis or like, and I've loved looking up all the facts, you know, like you've given some of them. I love hearing all the other evidence that this is true, but that to me is just a hobby. The reason I believe it is because I experience it in ways that you can't describe. Like, describing how to ride a bike or balance while surfing on a wave. Right. And, and I think, you know, when we talked before, it's, uh, it's all, I don't want to say it's all about perspective because we can make up any perspective, uh, you know, that might, might do us good or might comfort us. But it's when you, like you're saying that there's, um, I wouldn't say empirical, but it's almost that there's an empirical sense of it. Like, you know, the, you're experiencing, you're living, you're not just living as if you're living it. Okay. Like you, you say that, you know, and, and we know for a fact that people can reach certain states of consciousness, you know, without any drugs or anything else like that through breathing, through other stuff as well, you know, like sleep deprivation. And, and just, if we can reach that, there's gotta be some reason you know, that, and it's not just a, a blip, it's just that, you know, that we can predict how things are going to be, be. There ha there's something to it. And, and the whole idea, I mean, I don't want to get too, I don't want to say punch above my weight, but, you know, if we start looking at cosmology and, you know, and we look at the fact, you know, that we're all from the stars, et cetera, et cetera, like there's something to it. I just can't explain it, right? Because if you just gave me something out of the blue, I would say, okay, you know, it just sounds like you're trying to placate yourself or try to just calm yourself or whatever, but again, that's why I said earlier that there's enough there that I don't think I don't think anyone should be arrogant enough to claim we know what it is and that we can give a nice theory behind it. But I do believe that there's just enough to say that there that there's a reason to have to believe that there's something beyond the, the physical corporeal that we corporate corporate I can't even speak. Okay, the physical world that we see, and you know sometimes people laugh when I like they've told me some experiences. Uh, that they've had that they cannot explain and they look at me and they go oh, as a psychologist as a soft scientist I'm sure you're gonna mock it or whatever and I say no 
because that's really arrogant for me to say I can explain with 100% certainty, here's the rational explanation for what you had. I do have belief since I was a child and I continue to this day to believe that there are forces, energy, elements, whatever we're going to call them, that we cannot explain, that people experience and feel, and there's just enough, you know, even miracles. There are documented miracles that cannot be explained. And I'm not religious, but to say that something happened that's beyond our grasp, what, to me, that's not so difficult to understand. Like, why wouldn't there be? <laughs> Explain to me how something can come from nothing. If we, if, you know, like the fact that we don't, like that, that could have happened, why can't there be this other supernatural or paranormal stuff? And I, and I just want to be clear to everybody, I'm not buying into the many proven fraudulent examples. I'm just saying that there are examples that cannot be explained rationally and all the uh, you know all the respect to james randy from toronto um you know the, the one who he had the million dollar challenge where he said i will put up a million dollars if any um if if any uh psychic if any you know anyone who claims to have these extra sensory uh, abilities uh he gave a million dollar challenge i think it was about ten thousand before then he bumped it to a million and so with all due respect to him because i i love him i love people who debunk He's a skeptic, and I love him. He's put some really terrible people in their places, I, and I love that. Um, but and, and I think and I, th I think it's important for us to not fall prey to the people who will you know, prey on you know, people who are looking for answers and so on, talking to a, a, a deceased relative, etc. Okay, they're just predators. However, I would say though that, like I said, I want us to be able to hold out an understanding that there's stuff that we can't explain. A hundred years ago, tw even 20 years ago, some of the stuff that we know now, if someone had said, this is what's going on, we go, are you crazy? There's no way this can be true. So in any event, so that, that again, I, that's why I said earlier that there's enough evidence out there, most of it's above my head, okay? But you know, that there's, there seems to be enough to say that there's a reason to have a belief, not faith, a belief, that there's something beyond what we can see and physically touch. So that's my spiel on that. Also, I find from the pragmatic side that because we objectively are saying that we don't know, if there's nothing beyond the grave and you've prepared for some sort of afterlife, I see no harm done. But if there's an afterlife and you haven't prepared for it, then I see the potential for harm mixed with what Socrates pointed out that taking the opinion that you're going to experience beyond the grave, if that's not true, all you're robbed of is the opportunity to ever know you're wrong. Right. So that's the only thing you'll lose is the opportunity right. to know you were wrong. Whereas if it's the reverse, you will certainly know that you were wrong to have not prepared. And I find that is a strong motivation to follow your actual internal compass and your own conscience. It won't motivate you to follow some rule set that doesn't make sense to you or that doesn't actually knot your soul, but it will really motivate you. At least for me, I found it's the stop lying and the other, you know, basic ones. And then once you live that way for a while, because I know that's the other part of my comfort is by acting as if my angel's real and obeying it, I am now comfortable that if I die at any time, that's fine. I have no fear of judgment anymore, like facing God. And that's a much, much more comfortable way to live. I know like in the TV show, The Good Place, at one point when like asked why bother doing the right thing, one of the characters puts forward, well, I used to have this little back voice in the back of my head that told me constantly told me I'm an asshole. And it's gone now. And yeah, that's an amazing relief to have. So if you're a person watching this who has that voice, and I'm not talking if you have some sort of issue where you're too hard on yourself because you're depressed or something, but if you're cheating on your wife, if you're lying all the time, if you're stealing from people and you've got a voice in the back of your head calling you an asshole all the time, you have no idea the relief of turning that off. Like if you can live right long enough for that to shut up, it's worth the effort. Yep, that's it's a great perspective um, and has real life implications. It really does. The people around you and just the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that's that's the idea, the quality of life. Because when you, you said earlier, um, you know, you were saying that 
we, we talked about like Pascal's wager, basically like what, you know, if, if you're wrong about the afterlife, nothing's lost. The only caveat to that is unfortunately back to the predators, there will be people who say, well, live life this way and give me all your money and do all this. And like, you know, that that's what you lose. You lose the opportunity to li live a better life than you could have lived. If you fall prey to those who will take advantage of such belief. That's the only caveat I want to put out there. Otherwise, you know, again, living, trying to live a righteous or virtuous or good, even just good life. Mm -hmm. I don't see any downside to that, you know, because it doesn't have to be, it depends on how you define good. I mean, it can be self-serving uh, people's definitions, but the point being trying your best to not harm, to bring a, you know, to, to bring a better quality to yourself and to others. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty simplistic person. And to me, those are pretty, you know, simple guidelines. I don't always live that way. You know, last time you and I talked Mercury, I, I think you've been, you, you've reached a level of, determination to lead a, lead a good life beyond what I have. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm very realistic. So people can live a good life up here. I'm somewhere here. Not, well, my let's put it here. Okay. Not, not here. So, and I hope to keep going higher and, 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 and whatever that looks like for anybody always aspiring to do better and whatever that better means. And if I can ask Nolan, because I mean, there are practical limitations maybe that might prevent you from doing certain things that you would want to do. You talked about writing. I'm just curious when you see that there are more limitations imposed on you, especially as the disease progresses, how do you get around? Like what, what perspective do you take to say, I mean, I'm going to keep trying to do better. Well, I think this is where uh, Jordan Peterson helped me a lot, where this kind of idea of, well, at least don't try to make things worse. And I found, um, also reading that book, um, The Gulag Archipelago, it kind of um, reiterates that kind of idea of not making things worse. And so I think that's kind of I'm not sure how to describe it exactly, but that's that's kind of my I don't know the bottom like the kind of I don't know I guess the source or the the initial starting point that I take, and so I found just trying to yeah I found trying not to make it worse and trying to find um, enjoyment in the things that I still can do, even though it may be limited or less than what I could do before or less than other people. I found just trying to make the most of what I have is, um, is, is the best way to, to move forwards. So I think, yeah, the, try not to make things worse. And then kind of the next step, trying to um, make the most of what you do have and try to do, find joy in, in, in the small things or the things we sometimes take for granted has been, I guess, kind of the way I deal with it. Yeah. And I'd like to tie together what um, one of the last things you said, or in uh, like about how well I'm doing. And I don't take credit for my behavior. I've got a hallucination of an actual angel. Uh, you'd behave the way I did if you experienced that too. It's intimidating. Um, but where that started for me was not making things worse at a point where I was a fucking terror in the world. Like, my second psychotic break, my family were worried about me for months, just knowing it was coming. I was getting on a worse rant. I was ruining people's lives actively. I was, you know, marched in naked and bloody by police, handcuffed wrists and ankles. I was a burden on the family. The nights I made my parents and siblings cry, the bother I was to the police, the destruction I did to that house, the... 
the number of times I was resentful and blaming everyone else and screaming at somebody or crying somewhere else. And just, I was a terror and a burden for years. And it took lowering the bar to, I'm going to accept that I'm on permanent disability. I'm going to give up on any dream I had before. I'm going to set the goal at not being committed again and not killing myself. Beyond that, I'm going to try to not do any harm. And I'm just going to try to be as quiet as possible and not damage anybody. And my first two years that I went into isolation were a depression. And I was not the way I am now. And it wasn't, there was nothing practical. Nobody was relying on me. It was easy to say that everyone would be better off. No one would have to worry that I'm going to have another breakdown. No one would have to drop off supplies. And for me, it came down to I definitely would have killed myself. I didn't believe in the metaphysical. But the experiences, and I'd taken psychedelics when I was younger. I did way too many mushrooms. And somehow that never got through to me. The next day when I sobered up, I'd laugh at how stupid it is. I thought I experienced God on drugs. But when I experienced it in the psychosis, I couldn't deny that. And so I thought, as hard as this is, I'm not risking worse after the grave. And because I felt like God was saying, yeah, you're not allowed to kill yourself. And yes, you have to go through this. And I thought, I'd rather like take my medicine now than have it worse later. And so when, because some people will challenge Peterson where with the God thing of all people claim to be believe in God, but put your money where your mouth is. And for me, the big one is I'm here. And you have no idea like how many full years of my life I wanted nothing more than to get the fuck out of here and had every reason to. Um, but I'm here solely because I was too concerned that God probably exists. But just to tie it that as small as that seems, if you're a drug addict or whatever person who's gotten to a really bad place, whether it's like Nolan or someone no fault of your own that you're in a certain situation or whether, because again, who's, who knows whose fault anything is. Um, but just if you're at that place where you're a real problem in the world, start by just trying to do less damage. And those small steps build up over years. And the first few years, it's like going to the gym. You go and you're sore every day and you're not looking any better. And it's a couple weeks and you're still wondering if there's ever going to be any change. That, those weeks might be years. It might be years of trying to make the first small step. But then it starts picking up. And it gets easier to make the next step. And next thing you know, over a decade's gone by. And somehow you're sitting talking to wonderful people like Nolan and Oren and having your video posted to YouTube. It's ridiculous where it ends up taking you. And at first, it feels like a punishment. But later it feels like the difficulty required to give you a gift. And the only metaphor I can think of, although I don't have firsthand experience, is the pain involved in childbirth. But then the mother has the baby. And that if you can suffer nobly through whatever challenge God or the universe or fate or whatever you call it sets before you and you just do your best, seems to me like it's guaranteed that one day whether in this flesh or not you'll be also saying you know the same as me it sounds fucking weird but i'm grateful for the worst things that have happened to me and i see how that was necessary to get where i am now well that's why when we talked before that's why it's so important not to be overtaken by resentment because resentment means that someone has wronged you. You feel that you've been, you've been wronged. And if someone's wronged you, well, our chimpanzee DNA tells us, fight back, get back at them, get revenge. And, you know, so everything you said was the antithesis of that. Don't make it worse, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, then that's why it's really important. And that's why I said earlier, it's like have those moments, whether it's a day, a week, an hour, five minutes, something where you are able to acknowledge the pain the hurt, the anger, even resentment, okay? Because if you fight against what you're naturally feeling, that's not good either. You have to go with it. You have to learn to kind of go with the emotions and, um, 
and then just being able to, you know, to, to acknowledge, to accept it, to work with it. So in any event, um, so I think it's very, very important. And a lot of what you just said, though, um, you know, someone who's suffering in the moment, they're going to say, well, that sounds really good, but that sounds like a lot of faith. And, you know, I don't have that faith. Well, kind of like what's, what, 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 what is there to lose if you give it a shot and try to see, okay, maybe there is something to it. You know, really, what do you lose? You lead a, you know, going to the gym or, or being less angry or trying to help others or something, you know, like what's the worst that really happens? So again, that's the pragmatic side of me saying, here's how you can pragmatically look at the metaphysical, you know, and, and, and here's a pragmatic reason to have some faith. So there you go. And I can put forward sort of the magician's angle on an experiment. You can play with the metaphysical. Here's a simple magic principle. Our words and our thoughts are powerful. And if you want to experiment with that, just do one thing. Every time you encounter a difficulty that causes whatever negative emotion, recognize the emotion, recognize whatever injustice is being done. But notice that we're tra we typically ask, why is this being done to me? This experiment in magic is control your thoughts, alter the spell you're speaking into the universe and instead ask why is this being done for me and if at the end of that it's a question and a confused one like what do you mean why is this being done for me that i was cheated on or broke my back or but you just keep reframing that as a question and you don't even have to ask like answer it just keep every time you find yourself ask why is it happening to me change it to why is it happening for me and just see if that doesn't have some sort of consequence in your life to intentionally manipulate your internal dialogue in that way. For me, I find that profoundly powerful. Uh, well, I know that we have to get going shortly, but if I can ask you, uh, Mercury, is that something that you came up with yourself? Had you read it somewhere? I, I did my magic training sort of backwards where like typically, you proceed through the levels to access your holy guardian angel, at which point upper management takes over training. Whereas I went the reverse route. It's um, like my first psychotic experiences were intense, overwhelming. They didn't make proper sense. But uh, in 20, 2011, my is the first time my archangel appeared to me. And I interacted with it in such a way that I examined it from both perspectives. I don't know if this is a delusion or a real entity. And essentially, I've been under its training. Later, I found numerous, you know, magical systems and spiritual traditions that say all the various things my angels taught me. But I first developed my system um, with a lot of isolation and with training from an imaginary friend, as strange as that is. Okay. Well, just to let you know, because uh, the book that I'm writing, I like to take things and I want to give proper credit. So I am going to use that because I just like that. I, I just like when, when a, a turn of phrase, okay, a, a, a way of looking at something, just certain language. And I'm a, such a big fan of language. And that's exactly what, where the magic was, was the manipulation of language. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a reason that we have such powerful, you know, language capabilities, it's just beyond what should be reasonable to, to understand. Like for, for such young ages, we can develop this capacity. So that really spoke to me, just what you're saying. So I will be using that and I'll be using it with my patients as well because I've said similar things, just never that succinctly, okay? And maybe that cogently. So I will be using it and I'll be giving credit. I just want to make sure to give proper credit. I'm a big fan of that because I love when this type of, again, it's just a perspective that might resonate with somebody and it could change their life. So I, I'm, I'm really glad to have heard that. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I'm honored you think that's worth quoting. Um, so thank you. And, uh, just before we close things out here, I just wanted to, uh, to mention that if someone sees this and, you know, they're having struggles with this, uh, with the topic of mortality or anything related, that um, we'd be happy to uh, talk to them. And they can uh, write into the channel. Uh, the email will be in the description. It's uh, sorting myself out, the number zero at gmail.com. 
And so yeah, if anyone wants to talk about these these topics, uh, we'd be happy to. And, uh, and so Nolan, because um, oh yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, I offer private sessions for people dealing with any issue that they think I can help with. But uh, are you offering there that you'll join me on a call with somebody dealing with these issues? Yeah, I would. Yeah, if that's if they'd like to talk to me, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, and obviously, I would love that. I didn't know you were ready to offer that uh, service to the community, so thanks. And yeah, so if anyone wants to talk to either me privately or me and Nolan, you can write in sortingmyselfoutzero at gmail.com. And we, we're open to both private sessions or uh, recording podcasts with audience members, whichever the preference of the audience member is. Yeah, uh, and I just wanted to uh, to thank you, Dr. Abate, for for coming on here and uh, sharing your experience and uh, doing this podcast with us. Uh, I found it uh, helpful um, for myself personally. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate being asked on and. Uh, I, I think I said this to Mercury before. Uh, it's just you know we're we're social animals, and as I said a few minutes ago, we're creatures of language. So any time that we you know we, we, there's an opportunity basically to be able to discuss these things. We're not talking about the latest reality TV show. We're not talking about the weather. These are things that are fundamental to the human condition. And if if even a little bit of it just again clicks with someone, resonates, inspires, whatever or encourages them to then reach out to other people and talk, communicate, you know, anything like that. I, I, I see all good in that. So I really am very grateful, uh, you know, to you, Nolan, to invite me for this. And of course, Mercury for having me on as well. I do really appreciate this. And I'm, I, I, I'm again, I can't use any better word than very grateful uh, to, be, to have that opportunity. Yeah, and I'm also thrilled that we have all had the opportunity to sort of put a little bit of good out into the world through these videos. But then on a purely selfish note, it's always fun talking to you, Oren. And so I'm sure we'll invite you on again, but also don't feel the need to wait for that. If you ever have a topic of your own you want to discuss with me, uh, just let me know because it's always a pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you. It was very nice meeting you, Nolan. And, you know, we might have another opportunity together to speak, whether about this or any other thing that's uh, relevant to, you know, to the channel. Yeah. Okay. So thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And to the audience at home, anyone watched this far, um, feel free to comment below if you have any questions that you um, that arise during this that you want me and Nolan to address in a future video. And I don't know, we'll see you all again sometime. In the meantime, lunatic love to all.